Good morning. Peter, thanks for moving those wires. There's enough things on my passage today for me to trip over that I didn't need that uh, extra potential hazard. I just sort of pictured me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We've had similar near escapes. Anyway, good morning. And um, this morning, I'd like you to imagine being a soldier who is ready to fight a battle that you're prepared for and equipped for and suddenly finding out that although you're ready to fight the battle and you're equipped for the battle, you're actually standing on the wrong battlefield. You're totally out of position. June 6, 1944, young people, do you know what that day is called? D-Day, thank you. June 6, 1944, D-Day, the Allies invaded mainland Europe from England to begin to turn the tide of World War II. Thanks to a massive misinformation campaign called Operation Fortitude North, the Germans believed that an imaginary army based in Scotland out of Edinburgh Castle was preparing to invade Europe through the north and not through where the invasion actually occurred. Imagine that. Fortitude North was so successful that by late spring of 1944, in other words, just a couple of months before D-Day, Hitler had positioned 13 army divisions in Norway. Oops. Months after D-Day, those troops had still not been deployed to the actual battle because they weren't sure if the invasion of Normandy was a, was a fake and that there was still some imaginary army from Scotland about to show up in Norway. How useful were those troops? who were on the wrong battlefield. You don't always have to kill enemy troops to weaken your enemy. You can also make them ineffective by getting them into fighting the wrong fight. As we've been uh, in this series, this series has been entitled Fighting the Good Fight. And uh, earlier this week, I was asked to come up with a sermon title. I don't normally do that and, or don't no, no, normally like to do that. But I've been given uh, the passage for an entire chapter, 1 Timothy chapter 2. And so I entitled it, Fighting the Good Fight from the Wrong Battlefield. And in this passage, we're going to find three different areas where sometimes we get caught up and we lose our focus and we're distracted and we start fighting actually what is not the good fight. And so we're going to look at those things today and maybe we will... Um, learn somewhere in here where we could focus better on the good fight from what Paul wants the church to learn. Let, let me give you a bit of a context. Um, this is a, we're studying First Timothy at this point in time, uh, which is uh, based uh, uh, in Ephesus because church in Ephesus was founded by Paul. He pastored there for two or three years. He wrote them their own letter, the letter to the Ephesians. And then he sent Timothy there to correct a bunch of false teachings, and he wrote him a letter while he's pastor at, in Ephesus. So in my mind, I often think, foolishly, that it's really 1 Ephesians, and then 2 and 3 Ephesians are 1 and 2 Timothy, but that's not what they're called. We won't change it. That's fine. But really, this is like a second letter to Ephesus, in a sense, because it's going to the pastor of the Ephesians. And uh, boy, he's given him a, a tough assignment there to... Uh, he, he, to uh, rebuke and change and correct, a whole bunch of things are going on. And boy, Ephesus is a church, one of the churches we know the most about in Scripture because we hear about Ephesus again in the book of the Revelation. It's one of the seven churches that receives a letter from Jesus and it's recorded in the early chapters of the Revelation. So this is quite the study uh, church that you could study if you wanted from, from beginning to end. And the passage we're looking at today, the whole chunk of chapter 2, is bookended. Um, it's actually a piece in my mind with chapter 3. So chapter 2 and 3 go together. There are a bunch of series of instructions for the church, and they're bookended by these comments. The end of first, the ending of chapter 1 and the beginning of um, chapter 4. This command I entrust you, Timothy, my son, in accordance with the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you fight the good fight, keeping faith and a good conscience, which some have rejected and suffered shipwreck in regard to their faith. Among these are Hamenaeus and Alexander, whom I have handed over to Satan, so that they will be taught not to blaspheme. And then chapter 2 starts, first of all then, and now Paul kicks off the instructions. And so there's three distractions in chapter 2, and then chapter 3 we know was covered last week. 
out of sequence because of Father's Day, which talked about the qualifications for the people who are serving in the church. And then the end of the book, the book end of those two chapters would be chapter 3, verse 14. I'm writing these things to you, hoping to come to you before long, but in case I'm delayed, I write so that you will know how one should act in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and support of the truth. So those two chunks, chapter 2 and 3, are a series of instructions that Paul wants Timothy to help instruct the Ephesus on how to operate as the household of faith. I feel for Timothy. Paul did not give him a really pleasant assignment in many ways. Can you imagine getting the assignment to go and correct a church? No wonder Paul needs to bolster his courage in chapter 4, verse 11, and say, Prescribe and teach these things, but let no one look down on your youthfulness, but rather in speech, conduct, love, faith, and purity, show yourself an example of those who believe. I'm sure Timothy went into that assignment with fear and trepidation. And he was, had to be given a little wisdom as well to how to handle this situation. In chapter 5, we hear, Do not sharply rebuke an older man, but rather appeal to him as a father, to the younger men as brothers, to the older women as mothers, and to the younger women as sisters in all purity. In other words, Timothy, if you don't handle this right, you're going to offend everybody. So, good luck. We're going to look at what I believe are three distractions found in chapter 2, and we're going to ask ourselves the same three questions about each of the distractions. And trust me, by the time we get to the third one, you probably will be a little distracted. Each section, we're going to ask ourselves the same questions. First of all, what is the distraction from the good fight in these couple of verses? Then we're going to ask, because each one of them follows the same pattern, what is it that Paul is asking Timothy to get the people to stop doing? And then in each of those sections of verses, we're going to ask ourselves, what is Paul asking Timothy to get people to start doing that's a positive thing? We're going to look at each of those in that light. So the first chunk is chapter 2, verses 1 to 8. So I'm going to read it now. If you've got a Bible with you, we're going to be staying in that chapter. If you don't have your own Bible, there's some in the pew if you want to follow along and be able to see what we're saying. You should really verify that what I'm saying comes from here, right? That's an important thing. So 1 Timothy chapter 2, first eight verses. First of all, here comes the first instruction. First of all, then, I urge that entreaties and prayers, petitions and thanksgivings be made on behalf of all men, for kings and all who are in authority, so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. This is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Why? For there is one God and one mediator also between God and men, the man Christ Jesus who gave himself as a ransom for all, the testimony given at the proper time. For this, I was appointed a preacher and an apostle. I'm telling you the truth, I'm not lying, as a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. Therefore, I want the men in every place to pray, lifting up holy hands without wrath and dissension. What is the distraction in there? I think that the distraction in there because he's addressing the men of the church here who are maybe focused on the wrong good fight. And what I'm seeing in there is an, is an encouragement for them to not be distracted by the injustices of the world around them, particularly the injustices, the abuses of maybe those who are in authority over them, of the kings and rulers and leaders and so on. He Apparently, he's trying to get them to stop being angry. Stop being angry. I don't know whether their fight is with Rome. I don't know if their fight is with the Judaizers that we see so frequently in the scriptures. I don't know if their fight is with the temple of Artemis or Diana because one of the seven wonders of the world was in Ephesus, the temple to Diana or Artemis, which was so a major religious uh, situation going on there that they would have been in conflict with. I don't know. But that's the distraction. And we, too, I think, can sometimes get distracted by the very same thing. Rather than fighting the good fight, we're maybe more interested in fighting some political battle, some injustice that we perceive. Not that injustice doesn't exist, but injustice is not the good fight. The gospel is the good fight. What is Paul asking them to to stop doing? To stop being angry. That's what it says in there. I want you to start praying without wrath and dissension. He wants them to stop being angry, stop disputing. Why? Well, he gives them a couple of reasons. Verse 2, he says, because our goal is to lead a tranquil life in all godliness and dignity. In other words, 
Because that's our testimony. Remember, we are known by our protest marches. No, we're known by our love. So how can we be angry and yet say that we're about love? This is supposed to be our testimony. Another reason he gives them is found in verse 4 to 6, because you know what? God wants to save those people. You maybe have noticed that I emphasized the word all when I read it, because God wants to save all men. He wants you to pray and intercede for all men. In other words, also those people you're angry with. All those people, also those people who are rubbing you the wrong way, annoying you, getting you upset, you're actually supposed to be praying for them, interceding for them, as opposed to being angry with them. And Paul says, by the way, you're messing up my job description, because in verse 7 he says, this is also my ministry. This is what I'm called to do. Are you in alignment with me? Then we're not here about being angry with the world. We're here about praying for the world. So what's the distraction? the injustices, the, the battles that they're in in the world around them. What's he asking them to stop doing? Stop being angry. Stop disputing. But he asks them to start doing a positive thing, which I've already mentioned a few times. He wants them to pray. That's what he wants them to start doing. Instead of fighting the people you're angry with, I want you to pray for the people you're angry with. I love it, the, that last verse. I want men in every place to pray, lifting up holy hands, without anger and dispute. Well, I was thinking about that phrase, lifting up your, your holy hands. I couldn't help but think of Psalm 24, verse 3, that says, Who may ascend unto the hill of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? One who has clean hands and a pure heart. Now, when we hear clean hands, we think about guilt, right? We think of who's innocent, who's guilty, and so on that an Old Testament reader would have probably thought of something else as well. You see, in the tabernacle or at the temple, there was this massive bronze basin filled with water for washing hands. And the priests could not do a sacrifice or come to the presence of the Lord unless they first washed their hands. In other words, they needed to symbolically get rid of everything that was from out there and walk in focused on what was in here. And so I see an echo of that in that idea of lifting our hands, our clean hands, our holy hands without anger and dispute, washing away the anger, the things that distract us, but coming to talk to God instead of arguing with the people we're angry with. You ever felt anger with the powers that be? It's pretty common. I have to confess to you, I broke one of my own cardinal rules in the past two weeks. I commented on Facebook on a religious and political matter. I've never done that ever. I'll never do it again. Somebody I know and like, who's a believer, and I won't say, it doesn't matter who they are, posted a picture of a t-shirt and said, is it okay to wear this? They asked the question, and I felt compelled to answer. On the t-shirt was the face of our prime minister, in the makeup of the Joker from the Batman with the word wacko underneath it. I got ticked off. <laughs> and I answered them, and I never do this, and I won't do it again. And I answered them, and I said, the answer, my answer was, not if you believe 1 Timothy 2 is true. No, you know, you can't wear that if you believe 1 Timothy 2 is true. How do you pray and love and pray for the salvation of somebody that you are also mocking. You cannot do both. It has nothing to do with whether or not you agree with the person. That's a completely different matter. But we cannot be a people who mock and then think it's okay two minutes later to be praying for those same people. That just does not cut it. And that was what Paul is asking these men to start doing, to pray instead of to mock. You know, there's a really good example of this in the scriptures. I'll give you two quick ones. Number one, we know when Jesus was arrested, one of his disciples pulled out a sword and hacked somebody's ear off. He's probably trying to lop his head off, but, you know, fishermen, not that good with swords, missed, okay? And Jesus stopped them. Well, of course, that's Jesus. That's Jesus who we're supposed to be copying and following. He did not call his disciples into battle. 
he stopped and healed the person. Well, no, that's just because of the, no, that's how we're called to be. You know, within the third chapter of Acts, fourth chapter of Acts, Peter and John get arrested for healing a guy and proclaiming the resurrected Jesus. They're, they're thrown in jail unjustly. They're persecuted. They're threatened. And when they go back to see the other disciples, they don't call for a protest march. They call a prayer meeting. And at the end of that prayer meeting, the scriptures say, the house they were in was shaken. That's our calling in our culture. Not to be angry, but to be people who pray to God for those that we might be angry with. That's the first distraction in chapter 2. Second distraction occurs in verses 9 and 10. And I can see I'm going to have to use Peter's off to use phrase. I better hurry up here. Verses 9 and 10. Likewise, in other words, in the same way, I want women to adorn themselves with proper clothing, modestly and discreetly, not with braided hair and gold or pearls or costly garments, but rather by means of good works as is proper for women making a claim to godliness. I just got to put my glasses back on because I just want to see if anyone's wearing pearls today. <laughs> no, the point is not to not wear pearls. What is the distraction in, this, in these couple of verses? That we sometimes think that we're coming to church and interacting with people to get their attention, to be valued, to be noticed because of the stuff we have or how we've made ourselves up. We've made ourselves up, look handsome or pretty or whatever, and that's how we're trying to impress people. And in Ephesus, the wealthy women in the church, because that's who's wearing the gold and the pearls and, and so on, the nice clothes in Ephesus, the wealthy women in the church were flaunting their stuff and seeking res- recognition through their stuff in that particular situation. That was the distraction. And we can get distracted that way too. What is Paul asking Timothy to get these people to stop? Stop flaunting their stuff and stop trying to impress with their looks. It's a very simple message. Maybe no one here has that challenge. But some of you maybe do think a little too much about what you are going to put on when you go to a public gathering and are trying to impress people with how you look instead of who you are But he doesn't just ask them to stop doing something. Again, he asks them to start doing something instead, which is dressed modestly and discreetly, but more importantly, perhaps, to do good works and good deeds. He says to them, stop trying to impress people with your looks. Try to impress God with your deeds and who you are. That's who you should be focused on. You should be trying to impress God, not the people around you. And you know what? God does notice what we're doing. Jesus was impressed with quite a few women that he saw. He was impressed with the poor widow in the temple who gave everything she had, even though it was just two mites, whatever that is. But she gave everything she had. He was impressed. He noticed that. He was also impressed with a woman on the other end of the spectrum who had something super, super expensive, worth 300 denarii. Now, you may remember from another parable that a vineyard uh, owner negotiated with the laborers to work for one denarii a day. In other words, this costly vial of perfume was worth a year's wages. And it was nothing to her. She broke it in service of Jesus. A woman who had something super costly, a woman who had something that was, in the world's eyes, worth nothing. But Jesus impressed with both of them because these women, rather than being tied to their material things, because you can be poor and just as materialist as someone, materialistic as someone who has much, neither of them, one of them was tied to their material. They were tied to their relationship to God. And that's how... We get rid of that distraction. Oh, we're out of time. No, I'm kidding. (laughs) The third distraction is found, and this will be a lot more distracting, trust me, in verses 11 to 15, which you're welcome, Caitlin. I didn't get you to read that. I had you read from Matthew. So uh, verses 11 to 15 say this. A woman must quietly receive instruction with entire submissiveness, But I do not allow a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man, but to remain quiet. For it was Adam who was first created, and then Eve. And it was not Adam who was deceived, but the woman who was being deceived fell into transgression. But women will be preserved through the bearing of children if they continue in faith and love and sanctity with self-restraint. Nothing distracting in there at all. (laughs) I agree. What is the distraction there? The distraction there 
is the age-old struggle in relationships between men and women. That struggle which happens in the workplace, happens in the home, and guess what can happen in the church and can be a distraction from actually fighting the good fight. And so we're going to ask the same questions of this passage. Is Paul asking Timothy to get something to stop in these verses? He is asking something to stop but it's very narrowly defined. I'm going to read it in three different translations for you again. Uh, uh, First from the NASB, I do not allow a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man. NIV, I don't allow a woman to teach or assume authority. In the KJ, I don't allow a woman to teach or usurp authority. Don't you envy Timothy's assignment this morning (laughs) and mine. Anyway, it's a very specific uh, thing that is talked about here exercising authority over the church and exercising authority over the church through teaching. And we need to keep the context in mind. The very next verses, there's no chapter division in the original. The very next verses, we'll talk about who should be doing the majority of the teaching of the church. It says, here's who the elders should be, here's what they should look like, and these people are the ones who should be able to teach. So this is not some verse out of context. It flows right into a description of elders. So we can't and say, oh, that's some weird verse all on its own. However, it's really important for us to not go beyond what this verse actually says. And I want to unpack that in a moment. But first, I want to ask the other question that we've asked about each of the other passages, which is this. What positive thing is Paul asking Timothy to urge the women to do instead? Well, there are two things. And one of them is pretty Amazing if you think of the historical context in which it is spoken. He wants them to learn. He wants them to learn. You remember the story of Mary and Martha? Mary is listening at the feet of Jesus with the other disciples, and Martha's in the kitchen doing all the work, and she complains to Jesus, like, how come Mary isn't helping me? And Jesus says, actually, Mary chose a good thing. Jesus endorses that it's good for Mary to be sitting at the feet of Jesus and learning. My daughter-in-law is get, studying her P, getting a PhD in theology. I think that's cool. The, I love that it's the, one of the positive things here is that the women, just like the men, are supposed to understand the depths of the love and the grace of Jesus, the work of the Holy Spirit, what the Father's role is in, in the whole story arc of the gospel, that understand the scriptures. They're, they're encouraged to learn to do that, to be part of that. That has not been the case through much of history, the idea that the women equally should be learning the spiritual things. And there's a second positive thing that he asks them to do. You're not going to think it's positive, but the second positive thing he asks them to do is to do it with an attitude of submission. This is where in your heart some of you are saying, what? What? That's not a positive thing. Actually, it depends. You see, there's more than one kind of submission. The negative submission is this, imposed submission. My analogy for this would be uh, how almost every MMA fight ends in a submission hold, where somebody has a lock on on somebody's arm or whatever, and they're assessed excruciating, excruciating pain, they finally tap out. An imposed submission. The scriptures never talk about this subject in that way. And when in the history of church, that's how we've applied it, that's where we've created pain and have incurred guilt. You see, the positive version of submission is willing submission. Willing submission where someone lets another take the lead for the sake of order. You'll notice in the scriptures that any time submission is addressed to women, it's addressed to the women, guys. It's not addressed to the men to impose on the women. It's it's addressed to the women to somehow respond to and figure out what is their proper response to that instruction. Somebody gave me just, uh, I'm going to use it, Jason. Jason gave me an analogy, a story actually you heard from somebody else about pilots. And the example was this. Somebody was asked, who's a pilot, what's the difference between a pilot and a co-pilot? And the answer was, in many cases, Nothing. The co-pilot often has the same experience as the pilot. The 
the co-pilot often has the same education and training, the same amount of hours in the plane. They just don't happen to be sitting in the pilot's seat. And so when you're the co-pilot, you have a particular function to play. And when you're the pilot, you have a function to play. And it's not about who had more flight of hours and so on. And so the co-pilot, in that scenario, willingly submits to the lead of the pilot of the plane because otherwise the flight might not go so well. That's the positive side of submission. And that is a, a beautiful thing that is evidenced all throughout Scripture. Now, I want to take a lot, of, a few, I was going to say a lot, I've got time. I, I want to take a few extra steps here. And it's important because uh, just as the men in the early part of the chapter were tempted to be angry and disputing with authorities because of abuses of authority, in the same way there have been abuses in our history surrounding how we let our differences live out our differences as men and women in the church. So with your permission, I'm going to unpack this a little further to give us, I think, a more biblical context than we take if we just look at one verse. So just as Paul provided a few reasons why the men were to pray for the salvation of their enemies rather than being angry, he gave a few reasons here for why the women uh, should consider following his instructions. And I'm only going to look at one of them because of time. But he gives three. The first one he gives is, by the way, none of the three are a... No, I'll get to that. The first one he gives is this. Here's my reason why I say this. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. Huh? You're going right back to Genesis 1 and 2? Yeah. So Paul's view here is that this issue is not a cultural issue. It's an issue that goes right back somehow in his mind to creation and some kind of order that was put into place in creation while things were still good, by the way. Before the fall, this was set up, Paul is saying, that Adam was created first and then he was created and for some reason that has some kind of significant. God, for some reason, chose to create them separately, one at a time, not simultaneously. The second observation I, I, I note about that phrase for Adam was formed first, then Eve, is that the cross didn't change that because Paul is talking to Christians. Sometimes we think there are certain things that were changed because of the cross that no longer apply, but Paul, this particular thing seems to still apply because Paul is telling it to Christians. And Paul is quite familiar with the, the, with the cross and the effects of the cross. You mean just because something happened a long, long time ago, before I was born, that I had nothing to do with, I have to somehow live under a, a system like that? That started way back in Genesis? Sometimes the answer to that question is yes. Let me give you four other examples that have nothing to do with this issue that are just like that. That something that happened thousands of years ago or a hundred years ago somehow impacts people that had nothing to do with it and yet biblically they will have they will need to live under that system i'm going to give you four quick examples so i'm going to say it's just like it's just like it's just like i have to live with the consequences of adam so you know adam was told the ground would produce thorns and by the sweat i am kind of sweating now actually by the sweat of his brow he would do what he had to do well, the cross didn't cancel that out, at least to my awareness, because I still sweat and I still, the, the working still is hard and is a labor. And if the, cross had, if the cross had wiped that out, then I guess a prosperity gospel would be true, but I don't think it is. And so I still live under the consequences of Adam. Thousands of years later, that's just the way it is. Trust me, don't always like it. It's just like the 11 tribes of Israel who had to live for hundreds of years with the consequences of not responding when Moses, after seeing the golden calf, called out, whoever is for the Lord, come to me. And only the tribe of Levi responded. And it seems that the reward was that they became selected for the temple service, and nobody else could do that. And they received the tithe as compensation from all their brothers and sisters in Israel for centuries. Can you imagine being of the tribe of Benjamin, 400 years later and saying, how come I'm tithing and paying for these guys to do that and they get to work in the temple and I don't? I had nothing to do that. I would have answered that call. But this is the system. This was what came out of that. 
It's just like God picked Aaron and the sons to be the priests and no one else, regardless of how spiritual they were, could offer sacrifices or go to the Holy of Holies, not even King David. Man after God's own heart, man who provided Israel with all of its worship music that we still use today. Is that fair? It's what God set up. And it's just like God chose to use the Gentiles today to build his church. And though there are Jews in the church today, God is not using the house of Israel at this time to speak to the world because of something that happened centuries ago. Is that fair to the Jewish people today? It's the system we're working with under time. And so there are many examples of when systems are set up that you might say, this had nothing to do with me, but this is the way it is. However, we have created pain. We're guilty of having created pain in the church throughout the ages when we have gone beyond what that verse says. So I'd like to affirm some things that are true about women, and then I'd like to affirm the many times when the scriptures do not want women to be silent. First of all, the truths. It's clear from scripture that men and women are, were both created in the image of God. That both have significant value to him as his creation. That there is no difference in salvation between men and women. Men and women both become saved through faith in Christ. That there's no difference in our inheritance and reward that is still ahead of us that we're waiting for. That there's no difference in our access to the Father. We all have equal access to the Father through the Holy Spirit. And that there is, it's not a competent, comp, com, competency or capability issue. You know, there are women who are way better preachers than I am. And there are women who are probably much more spiritually mature than many men and I'll include myself in that. This system that God set up has nothing to do with that. Just like King David, his competency, his spirituality, did not change the system that he was living under. Number seven, there is a future time in which these differences are going to no longer, no longer matter. Jesus said that in the resurrection, there will be no marrying or being given in marriage, but we will be like the angels. There is coming a time when this system will be gone, and we'll, this is not how we will operate. But number eight, we're not there yet. And that's why Paul has given this instruction. Why, and why Paul makes three statements about, and, and answers why. All right. I want to give seven examples that it is incumbent on us to ensure are happening in terms of body life, when Paul and the rest of the scriptures do not want women to be silent. And this is where we often get tripped up when we forget about these things and don't encourage these things and make sure that we're acting the way the body is supposed to act. Are there seven? I better check. Seven. Okay. Number one. The scriptures are not asking women to stop praying publicly. The scriptures encourage women to pray publicly. In 1 Corinthians 11, there, it references the women who are going to be praying and how they ought to do it, but that women are praying publicly. We need to be doing that. Fiona and Becky, sometimes when you're up here leading the church in music and so on, you pray, and I love it. I see your heart. I see your praise of the Father. It's a beautiful thing. It's an important part of body life. Number two, the scriptures don't ask women to stop prophesying. That's not part of being silent. When Jesus was brought as a baby to the temple, by the way, not only was Simeon there recognizing the Messiah, but Anna the prophetess was there as well, telling everyone who was waiting for the redemption of Israel, hey, he's here. He's here. Now, I don't know how prophecy works today. I don't th necessarily think it works in the same ways it did in that special period of time. However, I do believe that God gives people spiritual insight and to share with the church. Judy, I think you're one of those people. And I know over the years, a couple of times, you've sent me an email on a particular matter that was thought through, that was speaking into, to a particular spiritual situation. And it taught me, it, it encouraged me, and I received it and I appreciated it. It's important that we do these kinds of things. When I preached loudly enough, and Beth came off as nodding, I know I'm on the right track. And I've appreciated that over the years because I trust your spiritual insight and your knowledge of the scriptures. Number three, 
The scriptures are not asking women to stop witnessing about Jesus. Jesus was quite okay with the woman at the wall going into the village, announcing that the Messiah was there and bringing everybody to him. The women are absolutely to be actively involved in testimony and, uh, uh, to our Savior. Naomi, I loved a few weeks ago when you were sharing in the first service about uh, your daughter's interaction with the scriptures and what that meant to you and the peace that that, that was bringing. I think that was, I loved hearing that. That was beautiful. Shirley, I love hearing about how you're witnessing to some of the people you know and getting us to pray for them in the, in the communion service. That's a fantastic thing. We need that kind of thing to be happening. Number four, being silent that has nothing to do with reading scripture out loud. Caitlin, thank you for reading the scriptures this morning. <laughs> but I also love seeing how you interact with the scriptures with your kids. And Josephine, I love how in the Bible study uh, this year, when we were studying Malachi, we were struggling with understanding the accusation of Israel about the offerings that they were bringing. And everyone who was in the Bible study knows the, do the one word that Josephine brought to us to help us understand the passage, the word leftovers. They were bringing their leftovers, their rotting leftovers from the fridge. Thank you, Josephine, for sharing that in the Bible study that helped me to understand Malachi better. Number five, it's not asking women to stop being encouragers and exhorters in the church. Ruth Lewis, I know you're watching. <laughs> and I appreciated your exhortation a few weeks ago from this platform where you talked to us about the persecuted church and you encouraged us to pray and to do something about it. You even provided an opportunity for us to do something about it with the letters that we wrote and sent out the Toru. That was for many of us, I think, what will probably one of the most memorable Sundays at Bethel this year. Thank you, Ruth. The scriptures are not asking women to keep their wisdom to themselves in all areas of other areas of life. Pauline and Sharon, you're on the building committee. There are some things that you know way more than I do, and I love that you guys are bringing your skills to there, although I, I know we want us to do this a little more quickly than we're doing it. But what you guys are bringing to the table there is a fantastic contribution and important. And number seven, these, this passage is not asking women to stop caring for the flock and shepherding the people. Marshalline, I've shared this with you before and maybe from the platform, how it touched me one time a couple years ago, church services started and some younger woman was crying in the lobby and you went out and found her and sat with her and prayed with her and, and comforted her that was a beautiful thing. And Megan, I admire the work you did in BC, despite how hard it was, and your passion for those who need care. There are many ways that the scriptures is asking the women to not be silent. And we need to embrace that and celebrate that, or else we are not a healthy body of Christ. You know, even though it's an uncomfortable subject, we need to remember an important truth that even in the Trinity, there is order. Jesus the Son submits himself to the Father. Think about these words from Philippians chapter 2. Jesus, who is of equal value, obviously, and equal competency to the Father, and yet Philippians tells us, have this attitude in yourselves, which is also in Christ Jesus, who as he already existed in the form of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a bondservant and being born in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient. Obedient to who? To the Father. Obedient to the point of death on a cross. That is our positive example of positive submission. A willingness to submit to the Father for the cause of the gospel. Wow. There are all sorts of distractions in life outside of this chapter. Battles we could fight, battles we could pick that are not the good fight. And Paul, through this chapter, is calling us to refocus on the gospel, on the good fight, not on the other things that distract us. And that's why I had Caitlin read the passage that she read. Because in that passage, it talks about all the things that we worry about and get anxious about and worked up about. It says, no, 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 no. 
Seek his kingdom first, and all these things will be added to you. We are to seek first the kingdom of God. Normally, if I preach this long, I would suggest to the music team not to do the closing song. But you know what? I'm not the one organizing this service. The Spirit of God is. Because Vicki came to me at the beginning of the service and said, I was thinking, is it okay with you? She did not know what I was talking about. If we close with, seek ye first the kingdom of God. I said, huh, that's actually the last verse I was planning on reading. So I think we're supposed to sing it. So despite the fact that you're warm, I'm going to invite you guys up here so we can sing that song together. <laughs>